When it comes to Shantae, I've invested no personal time into the series. Seeing as I haven't played any of the games yet, and I know very little about them in general, you're probably wondering why I'm choosing to do an episode on Shantae. Fact of the matter is that this is one of those rare occasions where a character has been brought to my attention time and time again, and I wonder what they're about, but I never chase up on that curiosity. There's something intriguing about Shantae though, so I decided I'm going to do a Who That episode on her, not just to analyse the type of character she is, but I personally want to learn more about her myself. I want to figure out what it is about her that's kept her on my radar. Consider this video a learning experience for me, kind of like how the Klonoa episode went down too, it's going to be a similar sort of thing. Before we get into it though, I'm sending a very big shout out to John Finley for backing me on Patreon. Reading your thoughts on the Shantae series alongside everybody else's was very, very insightful and gave me a good head start in producing this episode. So uh, thanks for your input and support my man, it is hugely hugely appreciated and uh, if you want to support me too then please check the links to my patreon page in the video description i'm slowly gearing up for some videos that i want to make next year and i gotta reach my funding goals before then so all support is greatly appreciated safe right then let's have a brief overview of shantae's backstory and see what i'm going with her eh, you should probably expect spoilers Shantae hails from a place called Sequinland. Back in the day, this world was inhabited by humans as well as a race of powerful protectors known as Guardian Genies. These genies guarded Sequinland from monsters and demons and your usual antagonistic forces. After a while, during peacetime, these Guardian Genies settled down and bred with the humans, creating offspring known as Half Genies, Shantae being one herself. Eventually, and for unknown reasons, the Guardian Genies all began to disappear, leaving the world unprotected, so it was up to the Half Genies to step up and take responsibility. Shantae became the personal protector of a little place known as Scuttletown, which is where she had her first major run-in with the lead antagonist Risky Boots, which sounds like the name of a Wu-Tang Clan member. They are said it, I said the thing. A conniving pirate by nature, Risky has kept Shantae on her toes for a good portion of the series, with the first two games entirely revolving around her dastardly plans. And when Shantae isn't having to deal with Risky's diabetes, scheme of the week, other bad guys will pop up to give her another bad day at work. It's worth mentioning that half genies don't store the same level of power that the original guardian genies once held, and Shantae has to put in the extra effort to utilise her magic. More often than not, Shantae tends to find herself pushing against the grain when protecting her world from danger. It's not always a victory for Shantae either. In actual fact, she tends to find herself getting the short end of the stick a lot. One incident in Scuttletown resulted in her being fired from her role as Guardian. Another instance caused her to lose her magical powers entirely, rendering her as a normal human for a while. Though, for all the problems Shantae finds herself getting into, all it takes is her determination, her friends, and another crazy adventure to put things right. As I said at the start of this episode, I hadn't invested any time into the Shantae series, but she certainly wasn't a character I found myself forgetting about anytime soon. This is thanks in part to her incredibly solid appearance. Like, I'm not kidding or exaggerating, I genuinely think when it comes to Shantae, her visual design is flawless. Well, as far as my personal opinions go. Let's talk about this. Firstly, she has two main colours, being red and purple. These colours already sit superbly well with one another because they're analogous. If you want to pair two shades together in a harmonious fashion, using two colours that are neighbours on the colour wheel is usually a good move. With Shantae, they focused on her main colours being closely knit, and they've made sure it takes up over half of her colour scheme. All the clothing is red, while her extremely long and wild hair caters to the purple. There's a neat balance between the two, and neither is fighting for dominance. That design choice is already comforting and eye-catching in its own right, but they go one step further and throw a complementing colour into the mix too, her accent colour. The gold and yellow located for her accessories, such as her tiara, earrings and arm braces, directly sit opposite purple on the colour wheel. By adding this shade of yellow, her overall palette is now given a defining kick to it. The warm and harmonious combination of the red and purple share the design space equally, while the yellow parades itself over the top to add spice to her appearance. It's like the warmest sweet and sour sauce you've ever tasted. Fruity in its delivery, but there's a line going through it that blasts your taste buds like a laser. That's what I see going on with her colour scheme. You've also got to take into consideration that these colour placements are also well presented. As I said before, the purple and the red are not fighting for dominance, and this is due to the fact that the purple focuses on her top half, while the red holds down the lower. Neither is really invading each other's space too much, and they mostly just meet in the middle for some light socialising. Then, to really send these colours into orbit, they placed all of these shades onto a lightly tanned skin tone. The use of a darker complexion allows the reds and purples to sit comfortably on the top of the base layer, keeping the mood of the appearance warm and stabilised. 
Looking at Shantae, nothing about her colour scheme feels jarring thanks to brilliant colour choices and the most suitable placements for those colours to sit. So is it the colours that kept her in my mind all this time then? Well, partly. I definitely appreciate the colours a lot, but I think there's more to it than that. Let's talk about the actual clothing itself and the type of character she is. Shantae is a genie type character. The genie mythos originates from ancient Egypt and the Middle East, a region of the world that is also well known for a particularly unique form of dance. Belly dancing. This form of dance would be used by Shantae whenever she needed to access the deeper depths of her magical powers, usually involving metamorphosis and teleportation. By pairing the genie traits together with Middle Eastern dance, as well as taking some influential cues from the 1960s TV show I Dream of Genie, Shantae's creators crafted a look that highlights these two sides to her visual identity. Her hair takes on a wavy, almost otherworldly appearance as it twists and turns in abnormal angles. To me, it looks like an abstract plume of smoke that you'd see escape from a magical lamp once you freed the genie inside. And secondly, the clothing that she wears seems to be a mishmash of belly dancer attire, showing traditional midriff tops coupled together with shiny jewels, while the trousers tend to take on a more fictional Arabian Nights vibe instead. And it's on this point regarding the belly dancer aesthetic that I'd like to touch upon. Belly dancers are not the sort of character type you see that often in video games. We've had one or two pop up in various places over the years, but they certainly don't take a leading role, nor do they have their face plastered all over the front of an IP. Shantae was already standing out for being a lead protagonist that didn't fit typical conventional character roles. I can safely say that the fact that she was a belly dancer had played a huge part in getting me to remember her, partly due to the reason that it was not common to see this type of character lead the series, but also partly due to something else. Something I'd say is more personal to me. You see, although I've been born, raised and lived my entire life in London, England, a huge percentage of my family heritage is Turkish. Like, we're talking 90% of my bloodline here. But, uh, just don't ask me to speak the language because I can barely string a full sentence together. I know some of the sickest swear words though, so if you need to know some sick Turkish swear words, you holla at your boy. But yeah, back to my point. If there's one dance that is commonly associated with the Turks, it's belly dancing. Go to some select Turkish restaurants or bars and you could find your table getting hijacked by a belly dancer as they step all over your kofte and pilav. When I first saw Shantae moving in this belly dancing fashion, not only was I bloody impressed with the quality of the animation, but I took note of how similar it felt to the things I have seen within the Turkish communities. For all the points I'm making here about Shantae's presentation in general, it's clear there were a lot of things that it seems I latched onto, and in doing so, the character remained in my mind for years to come. It's only now I'm finally chasing up on that intrigue, but you know, better late than never I suppose. Let's see what else Shantae has to offer me. Personality. On the base level, Shantae has your typical run-of-the-mill cheerful personality that you'd expect from a game of this nature. It goes hand in hand. If you're creating a cute looking game with gorgeous art, then most people would want to play a game where the hero has a positive nature about themselves. That's standard, so I got what I expected there. That being said, what I found to be somewhat pleasantly surprising was the fact that it's not her only mood. Shantae isn't unrealistic with her emotions. If something bad is happening, then she will feel sadness. She won't just stand there with a smile on her face and pretend that everything's okay. I think that's something that tends to get shoehorned into a lot of mascot characters. If your hero is optimistic, then for some reason, they have to remain optimistic even through the toughest of circumstances. It's very inspiring from a concept level, but it doesn't feel very emotionally engaging to watch. So when bad things started happening to Shantae, I half expected her to continue smiling and acting like everything was fine, and she didn't. When she loses her job as Guardian of Scuttletown, she reacts as anybody else would react to being fired. When her powers get taken from her and she has to resort to living life like a regular human, the adjustment period is a little tough on her. Shantae reacts accordingly to what's happening in her life. Does this mean that she lacks optimism? On the contrary, Shantae has bucket loads of it. It's just not presented in an unrealistic way. If she loses her job, she's going to be shocked and saddened by the news, but she's still determined to get her job back. If she loses her powers but the world needs saving, sure, it's a daunting task and she knows it, but she's going to get back out there as a regular human and still put in the work. I think there's a word that best describes Shantae's attitude. It's not unbridled optimism, it's not unrealistic enthusiasm, it's determination. She is a determined character. The series just continues to throw curveballs at her, and half of the reward from seeing Shantae succeed is knowing that she went up against any test with numerous handicaps and bad luck, and she persevered right the way through, all the while showing emotions that we'd expect from someone who's going through those troubling times. As a result, it made the character feel just that more believable. 
Shantae also has a slight short fuse. I say slight because you won't find her kicking off in a rage induced tantrum over the smallest of things, but there's this reaction she sometimes has when faced with time wasters or illogical behaviour. I think she might lack some level of patience too. And this is great. This shows her personality isn't without flaws either. There's a deeper level here to Shantae that I appreciate a lot. Take for instance her interactions with her friend Bolo. He has a tendency to be easily smitten by pretty girls regardless of their allegiance, even going so far as to vocalise his crush for the antagonist Risky Boots. Shante doesn't really want to hear about Bolo's attraction to their enemy, so she cuts right into his ramblings by telling him exactly what she thinks about him and his ludicrous thoughts. She doesn't mince her words and she doesn't beat around the bush either. There's a fiery little temper underneath her hood that sometimes kicks off if she isn't feeling the atmosphere and I really like this. It goes one step further in painting a much broader range of emotions that Shantae utilises. She's anything but one note. All of these emotions are beautifully presented with some fluid animations and gorgeous artwork during cutscenes. Honestly, it's a joy to watch Shantae just interact with other characters. Yeah, you, you know what, yeah, actually. Uh, can can Way Forward just make a Shantae visual novel or something? Like, just spin off one of the games into a visual novel so I can sit there and just watch all these characters interact and converse. I'd like that. And, um... I also want to romance Rotty Tops if I can, if that's okay. And yes, it's because she's green. Important. Shantae didn't have an easy start when she first jumped onto the scene. In actuality, those early days were a bit on the rough side. The first game was developed for the Game Boy Color, and being quite ambitious in its approach, presented Shantae with some of the most fluid animations seen on the console. As a result, the game needed a 32 megabit battery cart in order to run animations of this quality, which was a costly investment for publishers at the time. Coupled together with the fact that Shantae was a brand new IP, furthermore coupled together with the fact that the Game Boy Color was on the verge of becoming obsolete at the time of Shantae's release, and you can start to see a lot of red flags that publishers would be weary of. After a long while, Capcom made the plunge and signed on to publish Shantae, however this resulted in a few more problems. Due to the arrival of the Game Boy Advance and the winding down of the Game Boy Color, Capcom held on to the game for months before they released it on a console that had technically died. It has been said that due to the late release, and in addition to the expensive costs of pressing the game onto the enhanced carts, Capcom only published around 20,000 copies in total. The journalists loved it, giving it high scores. The gamers who managed to obtain a copy also spoke fondly of it. But due to all the circumstances that had been laid out before it, Shantae's debut went a little under the radar. For many years after the release of her initial game, the character fell into a small pocket of obscurity, being remembered by those who are lucky enough to have played it, but otherwise becoming a dormant IP for a long while. A few sequels went into production but never materialised. Things could have been left there. We might have never have seen Shantae beyond that first Game Boy Color adventure. Then eight years later, WayForward were able to release a sequel onto the Nintendo DSi's digital store, giving the character another shot at finding her audience. And I think this time she found it. Old fans came back to revisit a character they hadn't seen in years, new gamers came in to see what all the noise was about, and in turn, her audience grew and grew, and more games in the series began to find release windows to meet their demand. It's honestly unheard of in this industry. I mean, think of any video game that was released at the end of a console's life cycle. How many of those games sold well enough to be granted the opportunity of getting a sequel made? How many of those IPs have stuck around through such harsh conditions? I look to IPs like Ristar and Burning Rangers, Sega developed titles containing just as much charm but are not recognised by the company as worthy investments because they were released at an inconvenient moment in a console's life cycle. And here we're way forward, slowly trucking along with this one little mascot they had, and they didn't stop rolling until they found a good destination. That's a real success story for our video game community. Against all odds, Shantae is here today with one huge fan base under her belt. The character herself, the supporting cast, the world and all of its lore, adored by so many people, a huge percentage of whom likely hadn't even played the original title on the Game Boy Color to begin with, they are only here because the creators persevered until more titles could be released. So let's pin that importance to the top of the point I'm trying to make and wrap up this little heart to heart session. The character herself is determined in everything she does, and whatever catastrophe she is facing, she faces it until she succeeds. While here in the real world, her creators were determined to keep her alive by continuously facing the hurdles head on and getting through it until they could release more games. It writes itself. Shantae is a testament to determination and perseverance, both in her world and ours. You gotta give it up for Shantae, man. At least I am. I applaud this character. 
She remained in my mind for being a little different and thanks to great visual design she was also appealing too. She was memorable to me and I always wanted to swing by her series and see what the fuss was about. And underneath that appearance we have a mascot character that displays more than your average emotions for a character in this role. She goes through things, she has experiences and nothing about her is ever one dimensional. She's a determined character not just due to the storylines that she's getting herself wrapped up in but for persevering in an industry that didn't give her a fair starting chance. We could have lost this one, but we didn't, and I'm glad. I hope she sticks around for another bucket load of games and has a very bright future ahead of her. Yo, what's going on everybody? Thank you so much for checking out this episode of Who That. If you enjoyed it, please throw me a like as that always helps the vid beat the crap out of the stupid algorithm. You know, it's going down like that these days. And uh, if you're new around these ends, please consider subscribing and sticking around. I want you guys here. Thank you. Once again, shout out to man like John Finley for supporting me on Patreon with this. Big ups to all the patrons backing me right about now. And if you want to play your part, then please consider joining in. Links to the Patreon page are in the video description and all support is greatly appreciated. Before I duck out, if you need to catch me outside of the YouTubes, I'm available over on Twitter and Instagram too. So head there if you're into those sorts of things as well. I've been DJ Valentine. Thanks for your time. Take care and I'll see you all again real soon. And yo. If they don't know about me, let them know. Safe.